Now time for members' statements. The Leader of Her Majesty's yeah. Royal Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to talk about uh, my recent private member's resolution that asked the uh, Minister of Finance to task a committee of this Legislature to fully investigate the challenges facing service clubs in Ontario. Yeah, yeah. I've raised this issue many, many times, as you know, Mr. Speaker, and in February this House passed my private member's resolution, and I thank all members for that. I have received all party support for the establishment of this committee, but Nothing has happened. It's been three months since the government supported my resolution, yet I've heard nothing. To further my effort, today I'll be officially launching a petition to encourage immediate action. I remind this government that service clubs are the backbone of our Absolutely. province, providing social and economic benefits to the communities they serve. Service club members best understand their community's intrinsic values and needs, and fill the fiscal holes that government and other agencies cannot. Yet service clubs continue to deal with a number of provincial issues and challenges that are hindering their everyday operations. Once again, I encourage this government to give service clubs the support they deserve. It's time to task a committee of this legislature to investigate the problems that are hindering service clubs from doing the good work they do in our communities across the province, day in and day out. There is no downside to doing this. There are a number of very simple provincial issues. Uh, that look simple on the surface, but they're complex. They need uh, the input of legislators, and the, uh, we need to have service clubs come here to Queen's Park and give testimony. And we need to help them out. They Absolutely. help us out every day, and we need to help them out. Here, here. Member statements. The member from Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. I had the enormous honour yesterday to take part in the unveiling of the Essex Memorial Honour Wall that is inscribed with the names of 1,405 local RAF and RCAF veterans from Essex County. The monument stands as a complimentary backdrop to the Essex Memorial Spitfire replica aircraft erected uh, as a tribute to the late Jerry Billing, a local legend and World War II Spitfire A speaker. Yesterday, as we unveiled the monument, a, uh, Jerry's call sign was Black Hawk, and uh, as we unveiled the monument, a magnificent Black Hawk soared above the thousands of people that were in attendance yesterday. It was quite spectacular, and we knew that Jerry was among us. Speaker, my wife uh, Jenny and I joined nearly a thousand people yesterday to pay tribute to our veterans. It was an amazing display of community spirit, none of which could have been or would have been possible without the amazing efforts put, put forward by the Essex Memorial Spitfire Committee. I want to acknowledge the efforts of Karen Billing, Monica Totten, Eric Billing, Bob Swadling, Joe Gibson, Bill Riley, Todd Porter, Randy Volks, Al Timmons, Jerry Schinkel, Michael Beal, Michael Kohuchin, and Susan, Suzanne Allison, Speaker of the Committee, or as they are now affectionately known as a squadron, are to be commended for their efforts on preserving the memory of the memories of so many that gave so much for our country. Speaker, per our dua ad astra is the motto of the Royal Air Force means through adversity to the stars, to my friends with the Essex Memorial Spitfire Committee. Committee, I want to say thank you for aiming for the stars. You've done our community proud. Further member statements. Member from Ottawa South. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today, I would like to underline the work accomplished by Emile Ebertrien, two, res two residents of my riding of Ottawa South compelling work being done by Emile and Beth Terry, two longtime residents of my riding of Ottawa South. In 2006, the Terry's daughter, Sarah Beth, passed away suddenly. Despite losing their daughter at the young age of 32, they, they were able to turn a tragic event into something positive. Having known that Sarah, Pet, Sarah Beth was a passionate supporter of organ and tissue donation, Emile and Beth were determined to see through their daughter's wishes of being an organ donor. Although she did not meet the criteria to donate, they tirelessly ad advocated on her behalf so that her organs could be used to help save the lives of others. Through their courageous determination, they were successful, and Sarah Beth Terrier became the first organ donor after cardiac death in Canada. Her kidneys gave active, productive life back to two people. Her corneas restored full sight to two more. Since then, Emile and Beth have continued to exhibit leadership in their community. Their advocacy on the issue of organ and tissue donation has already had an extraordinary impact, and they have selflessly volunteered their time and work. For these reasons and many more, they were both recently recognized with the 2014 Trium Gift of Life Network Champion Award. I'd like to thank Emile and Beth and their daughter, Sarah Beth, 
and for their passion. For your, the compassion that you and your daughter, Sarah Beth, have selflessly demonstrated. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Member Stavitz, the member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. There are a lot of talented people in my riding of Bruce Gray Owen Sound. In fact, our musical landscape is so vast that some of my constituents decided the best way to capture it all would be to build it a home, a home for all the history of local talent and artists who make their name in Bruce Gray. And so it is with great enthusiasm that I rise today to announce the grand opening of the Bruce Gray Music Hall of Fame on June 7th in my hometown of Hepworth. To mark this special occasion, a real horse mule wagon train caravan will travel to what was originally the Hepworth Country Music Auditorium, founded and built by John Coker. Now it's home to the Hepworth Shell Lake Royal Canadian Legion. The Hepworth Auditorium has a long and proud music history with performances from several famous artists, including Canadian icon the late Stompin' Tom Connors, as well as Whispering Bill Anderson, Leroy Van Dyke, and Bobby Bear, all of whom will, or both of whom performed in the hall back in 1968. There were also T Mel Tillis, Don Gibson, Hank Lachlan, and Webb Pierce, and many more. It was there that I attended my first country and western concert featuring Billy Walker at the age of three, courtesy of my older sisters, Marie, Marge, and Bonnie. Induction into the Music Hall of Fame will be a proud honour for our riding's art and entertainment talents. The first inductees will be announced June 7th after a concert by local musical performers Rudy and Jean Couture. There will also be a silent auction hosted by Funny Farm newspaper columnist Jim Merriam and a live auction with myself, Jerry Ruth and Dirk DeVries of Sherbet Auctions, Peely Island Music Hall of Fame commemorative wine and a fish fry dinner served by Legion members. The inductees' names will be showcased on a seven-foot maple cherry wood epiphany replica guitar custom made by exquisite wood designs of Owen Sound and sponsored by exquisite 560 CFOS and Country 93 Radio. I'd also like to recognize some of the gentlemen who poured their heart and soul into this project, creating something that captures our vast pool of talent in art and entertainment, and most importantly, all genres of local music, from the symphony to the blues, country and western, and all entertainers. Entertainment writers, radio and TV personalities who made their mark in Bruce Gray. They are Bill Murdoch, former MPP of Bogner Jam Production and Promotions, and fellow music promoter Arnie Clark, who themselves left an indelible mark on our riding with shows such as Jailhouse Rock, True Country and Hepworth Grand Ole Opry North, as well as Jim Merriam and Kevin Moyes. It'll be a great show, Mr. Speaker. I welcome everyone to attend. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member statements. The member from Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, Speaker. Earlier this month, I had the opportunity to meet with members of the ODSP Action Coalition, a province-wide coalition of advocates tirelessly fighting on behalf of people living with disabilities. Many people with disabilities depend on ODSP for their survival, but surviving on ODSP is no small feat. Poverty-level benefits have failed to keep up with the ever-increasing cost of food, electricity and rent in Ontario, where a monthly benefit for a single person tops out at $1,100, while the average bachelor apartment in Toronto is close to $900. Due to their disabilities, most ODSP recipients are not able to work full-time, but when their health allows, many try to work part-time, both for the sense of satisfaction it provides and because they desperately need every possible extra dollar to pay for the extra basic cost of living in Ontario. This October, the Liberal government will cut the work-related benefit for ODSP recipients. They will cut the $100 monthly benefit that supports people with disabilities to participate in the workforce. This cut will deepen poverty and will create yet another barrier for people with disabilities to participate in the workforce. As the NDP critic for Community and Social Services, I call on this Premier, Kathleen Wynne, and her Liberal government to reverse this cruel decision and reverse the cut to work-related benefit for people on ODSP. Thank you. Member Stevens, the member from Etobicoke Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The strength of our communities relies to such a great extent on commitment and hard work of people and volunteers who advocate on behalf of their communities. And there are so many examples of that in my community of Etobicoke Centre. Today, I rise in the House to speak of such a group of people and the important work that they do on behalf of our community. Today, I would like to congratulate and thank the volunteers, the members, and the board of the Humber Valley Village Residents Association. Mr. Speaker, I'm speaking not just as their member of provincial parliament, but as a member, or as a resident rather, and a member of Humber Valley Village. So I've witnessed firsthand the outstanding efforts of this dedicated and effective organization and their members and witnessed their positive impact on our community. 
Over the course of the past several years, the Humber Valley Village Residents Association led the opposition to a proposed development in Humbertown Plaza that would have altered the character and quality of life in our community. They held countless consultations, worked with city official developers, and raised funds to ensure that they could be effective advocates on behalf of our community. Eventually, they negotiated with the developer for a smaller development. More recently, they successfully advocated for a site and area-specific policy to guide future development of the apartment neighbourhood adjacent to Humbertown Plaza. And that process, Mr. Speaker, is underway, and last month I attended a consultation hosted by the city on this very topic. Members of the association have and will be playing an active role on this as well. Humber Valley v Village Residents Association is sustained by an extremely dedicated group of volunteers who are devoted to maintaining a vibrant, prosperous, and safe community. Today, today I rise as their MPP and as a resident to say thank you for all you do for Humber Valley Village and all you do for Etobicoke Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Member Stamets, the member from Halliburton, Hall Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's my honour and privilege to speak on the passage of Bill 3, an act to protect anaphylactic pupils, commonly known as Sabrina's Law, 10 years ago next month. This bill mandates that every school board create and maintain an anaphylaxis policy to protect our children. Although I recognized them a few minutes ago, I want to mention the parents of Sabrina, Sarah and Mike Shannon who are here at Queen's Park today to help pay tribute to their daughter and the legislation enacted in her memory. <laughs> Prior to Sabrina's law, children in Ontario's school system had no defence against serious aller allergies that made attending school dangerous for many. After the tragic passing of Sabrina, members from all three parties recognized that we couldn't allow another young child to suffer from anaphylactic shock because their school was ill-prepared to handle those emergency situations. Helping to pass Sabrina's law remains one of the highlights of my time here at Queen's Park. I am certain that others, both current and former MPPs, would say the same thing. We are grateful that former educator and future speaker MPP Dave Levac from Brant introduced Bill 3 and saw to it that every member understood the importance of this bill, and as a result, it received unanimous support from this assembly. But the greatest accolades, Sarah and Mike, belong to you. Your lovely daughter, Sabrina, I cannot imagine what it is like to lose a child, but through that tragedy, you worked tirelessly to make Ontario schools and schools all across North America safer for all children. It is because of your hard work that since the passing of this law, no child in, Ontario, in an Ontario school has died as a result of an allergic reaction. Although you must miss her dearly, each and every day, I know that this law stands as a testament to your courage and commitment, and that the legacy of your wonderful daughter, Sabrina, Will be remembered. Thank you. Member Statements, the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to be able to share uh, news uh, with the House of an event hosted in my riding last week, the annual Gems of Etobicoke Lakeshore Awards Evening. Now, I held this in conjunction with uh, my local MP, Bernard Trottier. Gems of Etobicoke Lakeshore recognizes, honours, and celebrates local businesses, organizations, and community services located within my riding that deliver outstanding services, provide high-quality products, and make remarkable contributions to our community. Community members and residents submitted hundreds of nominations, and the winners were chosen by a panel of local judges in partnership with our Etobicoke Lakeshore business improvement areas. The categories were for best restaurant, food service, retail business, cultural recreational organization, service business, community service, and best new business. These nominations reflect the great commitment the local residents have to supporting the services and products uniquely offered in Etobicoke that make our community a must-see destination. And a characteristic that's shared by all of the exemplary nominees is their sense of community spirit demonstrated through volunteerism and involvement in local events and initiatives. Mr. Speaker, the Gems of Etobicoke Lakeshore offer me a wonderful opportunity every year to recognize outstanding businesses and organizations in my riding. These unique small businesses and groups in our neighbourhoods 
provide incredible service and deserve to be recognized. They are truly gems, and we want to celebrate those who, to work, who work to make Etobicoke Lakeshore an even more vibrant place to live, work, and play. Mr. Speaker, whether in Etobicoke Lakeshore or elsewhere, let's all remember to shop locally. It's good for our communities, good for the economy, and good for Ontario. Thank you. Further statements? The member from Beaches, East York. Well, thank you, Speaker. It's my pleasure to rise today in honour of National Schizophrenia and Psychosis Awareness Day, which occurred yesterday. And every year on May 24th, the schizophrenia societies across the country encourage Canadians to learn more about schizophrenia and psychosis. I would like to acknowledge members of the Schizophrenia Society who are watching us today and thank you for your hard work in bringing awareness to this serious illness. And by raising awareness, we can reduce the stigma of schizophrenia, which impacts more than 135,000 Ontarians. A stigma and discrimination have been shown to undermine access to health care services, employment, and social services. And on average, individuals with schizophrenia and other serious mental illnesses die 25 years earlier than the average Canadian. So schizophrenia also takes a toll on the families and the friends of people who die or are living with this mental illness, and they often become primary caregivers responsible for providing crisis intervention, encouraging and overseeing support and treatment. Caregivers are a critical part of the mental health support system. So in the past few years, we've seen a noticeable public shift on mental health. It's a subject that is now being openly discussed amongst the public and policymakers. And from its hu human toll to its economic impacts, the ramifications of serious mental health issues, including schizophrenia, are being acknowledged. So I'm delighted that the government is addressing this issue with the second phase of Ontario's comprehensive mental health and addiction strategy. And this phase of the strategy puts a focus on strengthening community health care services and improving access to care. And finally, I want to thank and acknowledge the great work being carried out by the Toronto East General Hospital, along with Wood Green and Neighbourhood Link in supporting individuals suffering from mental illness in my riding of Beaches East York. Thank you for helping build a better, happier and healthy Ontario. Thank you. Thank all members for their statements. It is now time